By 2012, AMD was struggling in every area that mattered. Its chip design and manufacturing were both falling behind Intel. The company was losing over a billion dollars a year and many analysts were afraid they might just run out of cash soon. Meanwhile, AMD's stock was down to trading at just a few dollars a share, proving that few people had hopes for a turnaround. But that same year, Lisa Su, then a little-known executive, was hired to the firm first as a vice president of global operations and two years later as CEO to fix things. Despite being the cousin of NVIDIA's Jensen Huang, plus also an MIT-trained engineer who was a competent manager at smaller chip firms like Freescale Semiconductor, few people knew of her at the time, let alone expect her to work miracles. But after she joined, AMD pulled off one of the most successful turnarounds in the history of the chip industry, returning to profitability and seeing its share price jump around 70 times since she became CEO. Oh, and she herself became a billionaire as a result too, so the following likely doesn't happen to her very often anymore. Excuse me, ma'am, do you speak English? Yes, I do. Well, you're a Marty's random person, the first one of the year. How are you and what are you doing on the grid? I'm doing great. I'm with AMD, so we're sponsoring the Ferrari car. Yep, the reporter thought she was just a random person walking around. Well, here's the story of how things turned around for AMD. This video was sponsored by Insta360. Disclaimer, a large part of AMD's incredible financial performance in the last couple of years came from their focus on new types of chips, like those used for AI data centers, but in this video I'll primarily be focusing on just the turnaround of their classic CPU business. Disclaimer, over. AMD has long been an arch rival and initially also a kind of copycat to Intel. The company's first real microprocessor released in 1975 was called the AM9080 and that was a reverse engineered clone of the famous Intel 8080. Similarly, seven years later, AMD became the first company to obtain an x86 license from Intel. IBM selected Intel's x86 chips as the basis for their new PC platform and they then selected AMD as a second source supplier in case Intel messed up. This forced Intel to hand over a bunch of their technical documents to AMD and to also give them a license, which they still maintain until today. Over the years, AMD also continued to reverse engineer processors like the Intel 386 to make their own AM386, and this type of kind of copying continued for many years. Now, from the start, AMD was an underdog that often played dirty, like how they openly admitted to acquiring schematics and logic diagrams to the Intel 8080, while early stories even include AMD people simply calling Intel fabs directly to ask them about the right temperatures for certain chemistry processes, and then random uninformed Intel engineers just giving them exact instructions over the phone, for example. Ah, those were the good old days. Now you actually have to pay people to steal their trade secrets. Anyway, of course, AMD innovated a lot as well. Perhaps most famously, while x86 started out as an Intel standard, a lot of parts of the modern standard actually came from AMD. Meanwhile, Team Red also frequently beat Intel at their own game. The Athlon line, of which I have two old chips here, repeatedly beat Intel to the punch to achievements like being the first x86 chip to hit 1 GHz, the first to bring 64-bit computing to desktops, and also to having the first native dual-core configuration for desktop 2, just to name a few. But then, little by little, cracks were starting to form. In the early 2000s, Intel was an incredibly strong competitor firing on all cylinders who had strong products, great marketing, an extremely aggressive legal strategy that fought AMD and other competitors relentlessly, and also loads of cash that they happily threw at PC makers to choose their chips, even if AMDs might have been better in any given year. Meanwhile, AMD was starting to struggle in three distinct areas. First was manufacturing, where Intel was slowly pulling ahead in the relentless race of shrinking nodes. AMD struggled with some of their jumps, like from 65 to 45 nanometers, and they also had to delay multiple key products like their first ever quad-core chip called Barcelona by nine months due to AMD's own fabs simply not being able to hit deadlines. Just a couple of years later, we've seen Intel hit a wall with their chip manufacturing too and struggle from there on out, and that's pretty much exactly the same thing that happened to AMD just a couple of years earlier. When running the fabs became too difficult and too expensive, AMD in 2008 decided to split off its manufacturing 
manufacturing arm into a separate company. This was first known as the Foundry Company and is now called Global Foundries. AMD sold the majority ownership of the fabs to the Abu Dhabi government, which netted them $700 million, and this initially seemed like a great idea. AMD no longer had the ongoing massive costs of running unsuccessful fabs, and instead it even got a one-time cash boost, which temporarily at least seemed to fix the company's finances. But of course, the new owners weren't stupid, they knew that AMD would ditch them if they could, leaving their factories with no customer, and so as a part of the deal, they locked AMD into something called a wafer supply agreement where AMD promised to quote purchase substantially all of our microprocessor products from the foundry company for 15 years or until February 2024. So really, while AMD technically made itself a fabless company and also got a temporary, very nice cash boost, it was still stuck with the same old factories that continued to struggle. Meanwhile, AMD also made major design mistakes, like when in 2011 they released Bulldozer. This was the firm's first major redesigned processor architecture since 2003, and the idea behind it was actually rather interesting. AMD noticed that as CPUs began integrating more and more cores, they also duplicated many of their components. They saw this as potentially unnecessary, and so with Bulldozer, they basically merged two cores into one unit, where they shared some resources like the fetch and decode stages, as well as the L2 cache. The idea was that by sharing these resources, AMD could save space and therefore fit more cores on a chip and potentially even improve power efficiency. That's a cool idea, I guess, but in reality, because each of the cores had now resource constraint, AMD couldn't really get the performance per core very high, and in reality, the whole idea just didn't really work out. Bulldozer ended up being more or less a design dead end, and as the chips of this generation also had to use global foundries struggling manufacturing processes, they just ended up clearly falling behind Intel. By 2012, the first year after Bulldozer launched, AMD was losing over a billion dollars a year and AMD's chips were just clearly losing across the board versus the competition. It was obvious to everyone that drastic change was needed and that was the year that Lisa Su was hired. Now, to be fair, Rory Reed was the CEO for the first two years when Lisa joined and he started many of the necessary changes already, but things really started to kick off under Lisa's reign and in just a few years, AMD had essentially managed to fix all of its major issues. Goal number one was getting AMD out of their disastrous wafer supply deal with Global Foundries. Friend of the channel John from Asianometry has made a whole video dedicated to how AMD left Global Foundries for TSMC, which I've linked in the description if you want to dig deeper, but here's the short summary. Global Foundries continued to slowly fall behind arch rival Intel in manufacturing for years and was dragging AMD with them little by little. Now, in 2006, AMD bought ATI, a GPU company who already used an external chip foundry called TSMC, and so two years before AMD even spun off their own foundry business, AMD already had some experience having at least their GPUs being made by TSMC, but getting their CPUs free of global foundries took a lot longer. The two firms made seven different agreements to their exclusive agreement as global foundries continued to struggle, and each time they made their exclusivity a little less exclusive. TSMC was allowed to make the first AMD CPU as early as 2011, but then Global Foundries managed to get AMD's business back for a few more years. They partnered with Samsung Foundry to basically use their manufacturing tech to catch up for a few years, which worked, and even resulted in Global Foundries making the first generation Zen processors. This was a real success but it wouldn't last. See, with each node, chip manufacturing gets drastically more expensive and complicated, making it harder and harder for a small player to keep up. And the jump to 7 nanometers was especially challenging as that would have required adopting EUV or extreme ultraviolet lithography. This is an extremely expensive and complicated technology, and it's part of what eventually broke Intel's manufacturing process as well, bringing them to a standstill for many years too. But Global Foundries perhaps correctly decided to not even try. They announced they just wouldn't make the switch at all and would categorically give up on trying to be a leading edge fab. Given how Intel has spent almost a decade trying to dig themselves out of the hole that they got into due to trying to switch over to 7 nanometers, maybe that was a good call. So starting with the second generation Zen chips in 2018, the main parts of the CPU were now made by TSMC on their 7 nanometer node, while Global Foundries just made the less expensive IO dies on 12 and 14 nanometers instead, and then from Zen 4 onwards, starting in 2022, basically the whole chip just moved over to TSMC. This transition did cost AMD a ton of time and money, and at times AMD had to actively pay their former foundry to get out of their agreement, but it ultimately was the correct move. 
And as Intel was having issues with their fabs, AMD actually started to have a clear advantage in manufacturing in the last few years. But it's not just manufacturing that had to be fixed, at least as important was design. This required a massive reboot, which again started before Lisa became CEO, but then really took off under her. AMD pretty much from the start realized that Bulldozer was a design dead end, and so just one year later they started working on a replacement. This was called Zen, and it arguably saved the company's CPU business. To come back from the dead, AMD knew that it had to not only catch up with Intel, but actually leapfrog it in a single jump, and so they set themselves the goal of achieving a pretty bonkers 40% IPC uplift with Zen. IPC stands for Instruction Per Clock, which means that the new chip would have to complete 40% more instructions at the same clock speed, more or less purely from design optimizations. That is hugely ambitious, because of course new chips would have other advantages too, right? Perhaps they would have higher clock speeds, or better manufacturing processes, or more cores, or anything like that. But this was just from IPC alone. And impressively, AMD actually pulled it off. In 2017, the first Ryzen branded CPU came to the market, and I remember actually buying one myself as my first ever AMD CPU. At the time, these really felt like AMD was suddenly completely back, competing at the very high end out of nowhere. The trick to this generation was luring back legendary chip designers like Jim Keller to AMD, who was famous for having played large roles in formerly successful AMD chips like the Athlon 64, but also Apple's A4 and A5 chips, and so on, and then pairing them with capable veterans within AMD, such as Mike Clark and Suzanne Plumer, and giving all of them free reign to innovate from scratch. CPU development funding was ring-fenced from the rest of the business, meaning that engineers could work in peace without financial constraints, and the team said that they felt free to start fresh. With Zen, they abandoned the kind of dual hybrid core design of Bulldozer, and they designed whole new CPU cores focused on having larger and more effective caches, as well as SMT or simultaneous multi-threading, which is similar to Intel's hyper-threading technology. But just as important was that these chips were designed to be modular. Today, a chip consisting of multiple little chiplets is pretty common, but AMD Zen was one of the pioneers in this field, and they not only separated out things like I.O. to a completely separate die, they even split up the CPU into multiple so-called core complexes, or CCXs. There were always four CPU cores in one complex, and these were connected together with what AMD calls Infinity Fabric, or basically just very fast interconnects and making the chips modular had many huge advantages. Of course, modularity makes scaling easier, so the same core technology can go into anything from small gaming handhelds to large server chips. You just add fewer or more modules and you can scale the chip up or down. But modularity also allowed AMD to have the very important parts, the high-end, really crucial things made by, for example, TSMC on their best node, while the cheaper, less important parts could be made, for example, by global foundries on a cheaper node. Meanwhile, breaking a large chip into many small modules also improved yields. See, chips are made by taking one large silicon wafer and essentially burning or printing the same design into it over and over again. Some defects are inevitable in this process, and each chip that has one typically has to be discarded as faulty. With large monolithic chips, you'd have to throw away a whole chip, but breaking it up into many smaller parts allows you to throw away just a small part that has the issue, leading to higher yields overall. And finally, this modular design also made future generations easier to build as AMD could iterate on each part separately, and indeed improve Improved versions of Zen have powered AMD processors from 2017 all the way until today. It's likely not an overstatement to say that Zen, together with the switch to TSMC, saved AMD's CPU business. Data from Mercury Research compiled by Tom's Hardware, which I've linked to in the description, shows that in the desktop x86 CPU market, AMD has been steadily taking market share from Intel since the launch of Zen, to where it now looks close to breaking the 30% mark. For laptops, there's an upwards trend as well, though one that is a bit less impressive as they have yet to crack the 25% mark. But meanwhile, most importantly, with servers, they managed to go from less than 1% market share to over 25%. And since Mercury Research reports revenue shares as well, we know that AMD actually has a revenue share of 35.5%. That means AMD is actually getting the premium end of the server market, while Intel has been pushed into the budget status. Wild. Now looking at market share figures, it's clear that change is extremely slow and Intel is still ahead in terms of volume. Intel has also finally more or less gotten its act together in terms of manufacturing lately and has provided Lunar Lake and Xeon 6 as examples that they can make competitive chips again too, and so the competition for the CPU market is thankfully far from over. 
And you know what else is far from over? The best deal for Prime Day. Insta360 is running a special promotion on their quirky little Go 3S until the 15th, which is easily one of the coolest cameras in the world, letting you get shots that almost no other camera could. It is tiny and also has magnets, so it can be slapped onto a lot of different surfaces, including loads of really clever accessories like this magnetic neck pendant. This can do both portrait or landscape. Nice. Once the camera's on your chest, you get super easy hands-free POV footage like I got here swinging 20 plus floors over Berlin. I was holding onto those chains with both hands like my life depended on it because I guess it did, but at least my camera was attached to my chest really easily. There's also, for example, a clip accessory, which I often love to put on a baseball cap. This allows me to get POV footage from kind of head height, and I find this super nice for biking, especially given how great the stabilization is. It is smooth and so easy. Meanwhile, if I still had a dog, I would love using the clip on a collar to get shots like these. These look really fun. The 4K image quality is honestly also just way too good for how small this thing is. Like with many of these shots, I would not be able to tell that they didn't come from a much bigger device, and even in fairly low light scenarios, I usually find the footage to be completely usable. Oh, and there's also this thing that is both a kind of charging case and also a wireless monitor, so you can actually see and control what you're shooting remotely. How cool is that? There really isn't any other camera like this. And if you buy until the 15th of July, you'll get 20% off the Go 3S for Prime Day. And if you're also one of the first 20 people to buy through my link, you'll even get a bonus quick creator to make offloading your footage easier. Meanwhile, Insta360 also has discounts on a bunch of other cameras that I've linked in the description as well. So check out the Insta360 cameras at the link in the description. Happy shooting, and I'll see you in the next video.